Well, as you might be able to tell, it is raining very heavily here at Sebring International Raceway, uh, which unfortunately, uh, well, the rain didn't put an end to the World Endurance Championship 1,000 miles of Sebring. It was the threat of the lightning, which um, you can very much tell is happening, hopefully, on the camera. It's, I guarantee you it's probably more dramatic in person than it is uh, on the video. Um, but obviously, uh, a, bit, a bit of a shame, a bit of a wet fart, I guess, to use a pun, to finish this race, um, which had so much promise and looked like it was going to be quite a barn burner, especially with this, well, maybe not this weather coming in at the end, um, kind of leading to an exciting finish. We'll talk about uh, the WEC race, um, but certainly I have to preview as well uh, the 12 hours of Sebring for tomorrow. Um, a couple of uh, important notes on pole sitters. Um, number one, uh, number one position on the field doesn't mean too much in a 12-hour race, obviously. But Sebastian Bourdais set a DPI track record today, and the 01 Chip Ganassi Racing uh, Cadillac DPI is on the pole position. Um, the uh, the number 63 Risi Competizione Ferrari is on pole in GTD Pro, um, and the number 16 Wright Motorsports Porsche. Um, is leading the field in uh, GTE, or uh, sorry, GTD AM. I, I'm going to screw that up several times uh, because, of course, there's pro and AM categories in both WEC, and it's a difference between an E and a D. So, uh, real quick, um, I did get to interview Ricky Taylor, who will be rolling off in third position for uh, the Wayne Taylor Racing Acura. So, here's his interview, and then we're going to talk WEC. Ricky Taylor, I know it doesn't mean much today, but P3 in qualifying, how are you feeling going into tomorrow's 70th running of the 12 Hours of Sebring? Yeah, P3, I mean, better than we expected. I mean, practice, you never know what everybody else is doing, um, but the guys have been changing the car nonstop. But the thing about Sebring is, if you have a good car in the day, you're not going to have a good car at night and vice versa. So we're trying to think about a car that we can survive the daytime and get tonight with with something left to fight to fight for uh, in the cooler conditions. So to qualify th third, uh, knowing that we're kind of planning on the end of the race was was good. We're optimistic with, with that in mind. That's always the interesting thing that I notice about the Acuras, is you guys seem to really like the night. Is, is that down to the turbocharged engine, or what? what is the difference between you guys versus the opposition kind of in the night? Because you've driven both cars. Yeah, exactly. I think um, yeah, the Acura obviously performs very well at night, and um, the good thing about Sebring is that's when that's when we need to make our money, and uh, so so yeah, I think I think we can play into that a bit. Obviously, Wayne Taylor Racing. If you look at even in the Cadillac days, they were also very strong at night, and I think it's something philosophically of how they run the cars um, that that bodes well in, in the nighttime in the cooler conditions. Um, this weekend, it's going to be in the high 80s, maybe even touch 90 in the day. So it's going we're going to have our hands full for sure to survive through that bit um, and so we, we had a qualifying car today but we're, we're gonna have to change it quite a bit for tomorrow and and the guys are on top of all the changes we're gonna we're gonna be making uh, so yeah it's, it's looking it's looking okay but we don't 100% know until we get there more traffic than usual that was the big topic at Daytona it's gonna be a big topic here how are you expecting the kind of new dynamic of a merged gigantic GTD field to kind of weave through for 12 hours yeah, it's it's really cool. I always love to see the series healthy, and when you see that huge GT field on the entry list, it's like, wow, that's going to be a lot of work. Um, but for us as drivers, it's just another challenge, and I think in practice, you start thinking about how you're going to treat the race because the intensity is going to go up, and I think for the first eight hours, it's just going to be normal. We're just going to take risk here and there, but man maintain track position as well as we can, but Philippe and Will and I have already been t talking to each other, man, those last couple of hours. With the amount of risk you have to take to win these races uh, at the end and with the number of cars that are surely going to be left, even if there is some level of attrition, it's going to be a lot of a lot of risk, I think, at the end for, for all the finishing drivers. So uh, we're, we're all kind of tuning our minds into to what kind of intensity is coming. And, and you've been doing a lot of work this weekend because you know, your teammates are currently out there, or at least in the pit lane. Uh, what has that been like, and, and are you expecting that to change very much tomorrow with, with uh, you know, maybe a lack of track time for some of your teammates? 
Yeah, I, I feel bad for Will. He hasn't had a clear lap all weekend. Um, I mean, he's been in traffic. Every time he gets in the car, he's in traffic. Uh, Philippe's had some good time in the car, and he at least knows the car a lot better than Will does. So I have no question Philippe's going to be right there. Um, Will Will always, he's, he's like a veteran. He doesn't show what he has until the race, so I'm confident he's going to be there. But I do feel bad that they haven't had as much time as I have in the car. Um, and, but I think the big game is going to be recovering from, from tonight's wet race and, and you know, resetting themselves for, for an even longer challenge tomorrow. Okay, so obviously, and you can see the rain. I'm going to get a shower here in a second. Um, the, the, the big story I, I looked at coming into the World Endurance Championship uh, 1,000 miles of Sebring was certainly the hypercar battle, Alpine, Glickenhaus, and Toyota. And uh, while it wasn't certainly the barn burner I, hoped, I think we hoped and expected it would be, um, I think definitely it's a surprise and a pleasant one that Singatech Alpine was the one uh, that ended up coming home with the overall victory today. They got the pole position, and really they weren't touched. Um, certainly Toyota was pulling some strategy, certainly tried uh, some things to try to get ahead of uh, Alpine, but ultimately Alpine really controlled this race. Um, and that's great. Certainly uh, the biggest story, though, of the hypercar division, uh, aside from uh, the, the, the great win for Alpine, was that big crash that Jose Maria Lopez had. It all began when uh, Dr. McDreamy's car and uh, Lopez got into it. Lopez nosed into the wall and then, of course, uh, later tried to drive through uh, the damage, oversped, and the car went straight into the wall, flipping upside down, thankfully. Jose Maria Lopez walked away from what it was, a very dramatic looking accident. Um, so Toyota ultimately, again, didn't quite have the pace. Now they did beat Glickenhaus. The uh, Glickenhaus was third overall, Toyota second overall uh, with the number eight car. Uh, but again, Signatech Alpine in a grandfathered car, an old LMP1. So the more things change, the more they stay the same here at uh, Sebring, an LMP1 car winning overall. Uh, GTE, Pro, I also want to talk about because you know we, we've documented so much the the struggles of of the Corvette team, particularly in IMSA, and I think we're going to see that again tomorrow. Um, but uh, they were quick all day today. It was a huge battle between the single Corvette, the single full season Corvette, and the two uh, Porsche uh, factory cars. And and I know Coop, Coop's car, the WeatherTech car from last year. Um, they might as well have been factory cars, but it was kind of weird to see uh, factory GT Porsches and factory GT liveries uh, running again. Listen to that. Great. Holy God. But, uh, yeah, it was ultimately Porsche coming out on top. The Corvette was the meat in the Porsche sandwich, um, and that was how the GT uh, division all uh, managed to play out. Finally, LMP2, I, I guess I'm just going to ignore GTM, like most people, I guess. <laughs> That's, that, I shouldn't have said that, but um, LMP2 was interesting because the United Auto Sports car won, and not only that, the United Auto Sports car won that was carrying 16-year-old Josh Pearson, who drove for Exclusive Autosport in Indy uh, or USF 2000 last year, moves up to, uh, to LMP2. He's going to run a full season as well as the 24 Hours of Le Mans, becomes the youngest driver to win a class in World Endurance Championship and certainly the youngest driver to win a major race class here at Sebring. Um, so that's certainly notable. An American driver um, who seems to be uh, that he's going to make some, uh, some waves on the international stage. So uh, that's, well, part one of Super Sebring and part one for a three-part weekend of coverage. World Endurance Championship over, IMSA tomorrow, IndyCar on Sunday. I'm nuts. What am I doing? So uh, from the uh, from the tin roof porch of the media center here at Sebring International Raceway, hopefully a drier and complete race tomorrow. Thank you guys so much for watching. This has been David Land on YouTube, and we'll see you in the next video.